communication complexity and I will give you some of the weird things that you can do with um, qubits. And then in lecture 3 I uh, want to talk a little bit about the limitations of quantum computing and actually that kind of touches upon what at least at the open problems that Sasha was talking about. But let's not skip ahead too much. Um, let's talk about physics and computing because as we all know computation really is a physical thing. I mean we have computers that do computation for us and computers are bound by the laws of physics and particularly since we want these devices to be faster and faster we have to make them smaller and smaller and when you make them small you will soon encounter quantum effects and actually we do encounter them and uh, nowadays uh, what, what the engineers are doing is trying to shield these quantum effects from the computer try not to use them but I guess the message here is that you actually might use them and do something smart with them which has a, a, the benefit that you can enable making your computing devices smaller and moreover as we will see you um, may be able to have uh, fundamentally faster algorithms than that what you have on a normal computer in any case it, it makes good reason to to study computing in uh, in the presence of quantum mechanics because that's the the, 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 the best description of nature that we have today. Um, okay, so um, actually forget this overview. Uh, important quote or an uh, amusing quote of Richard Feynman says, "What I'm going to tell you about is what uh, on his Nobel laureate in 1966 uh, lecture." Uh, what I'm going to tell you about is what we teach our physics students in the third or fourth year of graduate school. Uh, it is my task to convince you not to turn away because you don't understand it. You see, my physics students don't understand it. That's because I don't understand it and nobody does. <laughs> so I guess I should say if you don't understand it, please don't raise your hand. No, I <laughs> <laughs> should stop you. Um, but I can of course answer that nobody does. Um, okay, so what is quantum mechanics? I think a, a, good, a good way of pointing out the particularities of quantum mechanics is by means of a experiment. Mm -hmm. huh? Why do I not get the whole thing? No. So this here should be a light source. Um, Koya, why don't I get the whole... Uh, yeah. screen. But on the screen you have it or not? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, no idea actually. Okay. Maybe we can just make that something small. Something settings maybe. Oh, little right. little bit are... oh, I think the bottom is... Uh, the bottom is on the notebook. On the notebook. Um, on the notebook. Hi, the not notebook. here. On, on the your laptop. Here. You throw simply what you see on the notebook. On the notebook you see something. Mm. Okay, well, no. let's continue. I don't know how to how to change that. Maybe it's a Russian style. <laughs> no, I be my in this part is sens censorized. <laughs> um, but you are running Microsoft Windows, I guess. <laughs> we have some expert from Microsoft, indeed. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay. So 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 this is so polarized polarized light light. And if you don't know what polarization is, just think of it as a property of the light, uh, like like uh, its color. Light also has a, a polarization, and moreover, you can measure this polarization. And in this particular case, this and, and, and what you get out when you measure it, it, it gives you a, a direction, and in this direction, it gives us this this 45 degree angle uh, arrow. And now imagine that I have this light source with this polarized light and I shine it onto a calcite crystal. And a calcite crystal is, looks something like glass and, and when you shine light on it, it goes through. And in particular, it will actually split the beam in two beams. And each of these two beams will have half the intensity of the light that came in, which makes sense 
because it shouldn't shouldn't be more intense uh, what, what what comes out. So so the intensity is split in half, and you get these two beams beams there. Now, what you can do is you can measure the polarization of these two beams, and if you measure the top one, you will see that the polarization has changed to horizontal, and when you measure the lower one, you will find that the polarization is vertical. Okay. So now let's add a second calcite crystal. It could be exactly the same as the first. Um, and now if you shine the light through it, again, you have the effect of the first one. But the second one, it will actually recombine these two beams into one beam, if you do it correctly. And as you see, the intensity of the light here is the same as the intensity that went in. So no light is lost. So any idea what the polarization is of the light that comes out here? The same? No. The same as, as the, as the same as what comes in. Yeah. So 40, 45. Mm. That's right, right? <laughs> <laughs> you saw my talk before, yes. no? Um, indeed, the, 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 the light that comes here is, 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 is the same as that comes in. And a cla you can explain this phenomenon in a classical way by saying that um, these two beams, these two polarizations kind of interfere with each other and they add up. And when you add up this, uh, this direction and this direction, you get this in-between direction back. And so these two light beams interfere and there's a perfectly classical explanation of this and a classical description of this. So all is fine and dandy. Um, let's continue a little bit more with this experiment and let's block one of the tracts. For example, if we block the lower tract, then the light only takes this upper uh, path, and since it cannot interfere anymore with the lower path, you will get that the polarization here is horizontal, and if you were to block the upper path, you get that the polarization here is vertical, for the same reason that this polarization cannot interfere with the top one anymore. Uh, all, all no, no problems yet. Why does it not split in two? Uh, why does it not split in two? Who doesn't split in two? Um, uh, in, the in the second crystal. Upon entering the second crystal. Oh. So because you uh, just, so somehow you have waves, so and you select waves in this direction. No, no, it's a good, it's a good question, because it's this, this seems the same, similar, same situation, although half the intensity, of the light that went in in the first one. But the polarization is different. So uh, so it must have to do something with the polarization. That <laughs> but the crystal is asymmetric. Sorry. The okay. crystal okay. should be asymmetric. Yeah. The crystal. No. Calcite. No, but that's what I drew, but I don't think so. No, but if... if uh, it's, it's, but it, they, they should be like parallel. Ah, no, they, they have internal structure, the crystals, so yeah. you then cannot yeah. just take any crystal and then enter it. No, I think you need, need, you need a special crystal, but, mm -hmm. um, it's I think, but I think these two should be the same, though. They can be the same. Mm -hmm. They should be aligned. Sure, and they should be aligned perfectly. And mm -hmm. Actually, I, I, still, it, I still want to do this, this one mm -hmm. on, on the desk, because that's, that's possible. Um, but, but what is much harder to do is th what I want to do now, and that is, here we have this, this bright light source shining through these two, two crystals. Um, let's now do the, the following thought experiment, and let's dim the light source, and let's make it extremely weak. And let's make it so weak that only single photons come out of it. Um, now, now, you can think of single photons as like particles. Um, light particles, and I have drawn it here as a, as a little bullet, and there's, there's a very good reason to, to think that light actually uh, consists out of these, these, these particles, and you, they have the property that if you measure it, it, it either clicks or it doesn't click, so it's, it's there or it's not there, just, just like a bullet. So by m making the light very dim, you have these, these single photons, they're called, that come out of your light source, and now let's, let's do the, the same thing again. And let's shoot the single photon at our crystal. Oh, uh, it, it, it happened to t t take the upper track. And now when we repeat the experiment and we do it again, then, oh, now we found it. The lower one, let's do it a thousand times. 
and you will see that about half of the time you find the photon in the top spot and half of the time you find it at the bottom. And by the way, this is as expected because the, 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 when you put a continuous uh, 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 ray of light through it, then you saw that its density was halved. So when you do single photons, you should expect that half the time it's up, half the time it's down. Moreover, you can actually also measure the polarization of a single photon, or put differently, it has a, a, a polarization. And when you were to measure that, which is a very hard thing to do of single photons, then you would find that this polarization is horizontal and this polarization is vertical. So now let's repeat the same experiment as before and let's add the second crystal and let's shoot a photon through. And of course, when we don't do anything here, we will find the photon here. And moreover, the polarization, as we saw in the, the continuous case, is 45 degrees. All, all fine and dandy. Now let's look at this following harmless thesis that says a photon took either path A or took path B. Let's sort of forget about why and how it chose path A or B, but it seems like a reasonable thing to say about the, the experiment we saw so far that when we shoot the photon it somehow decides whether it takes the A path or it takes the B path. Okay? So uh, is the theoretical picture or the physicists are really able to create a one single photon and then detect a single photon? Um, th th this is not an easy thing to do but, but nowadays th th there are experiments that actually do create single photons. No, yes. To create single photons are not easy, you can do it yourself. But to detect it is, a, is a uh, the, the creation is actually much harder than detection. Detection is easier than creation of single photons. The problem is that you might you you, you easily make two. <laughs> <laughs> and then they go they go different paths. <laughs> so making one single one is, is, is the hard thing to do. Um, Okay, so, so, so let's look at this, this harmless thesis. Sasha, let's look at this harmless thesis. <laughs> and let's block path A. And now when we shoot the photons through, half of the photons we actually catch in path A, and half of them go through. And moreover, the ones that we caught at the upper part have horizontal polarization, and the ones that we didn't catch but went through half of them have vertical polarization. And now let's zoom in mentally on the guys that took the lower path. So let's only do the runs, consider the runs where we took the lower path and ignore the photons that took the upper path. This happened half the time anyhow. And now if the situation is like this, this photon went through, it chose B, and it had polarization 45 degrees. However, when we block the upper path, <laughs> but still the photon decided to take B, but we block the path that it doesn't take, its polarization changed. So how on earth can that be? How can this photon sense or know that you put something on top of its head and then by doing that it will change its own polarization? That seems to be happening here. Okay, so what's wrong? Well, what's wrong was this seemingly harmless thesis that said the photon took either path A or path B. And what a correct way, or at least, yeah, a correct way of describing the situation is to throw away this idea that you can have, you have to do either one or the other, and that is quantum mechanics tells us that actually the photon took both path A and path B at the same time. And physicists call this the photon is in a superposition of path A and path B at the same time. So strange, but I mean this is a weird thing to think about and it's, it's weird because you have to interpret it, but nevertheless what is easy to do is to write down a mathematical framework, which is quantum mechanics, and do calculations with this kind of weird phenomenon and what comes out is that indeed 
nature behaves like this. Every time we do experiments to falsify this weirdness, it turns out that it actually is, it does as predicted. So quantum mechanics is, is the most complete description of nature to date, and it has these two weird um, properties, this superposition principle, which says that a particle can be at two positions at the same time, and it has this even weirder property that this particle, while in superposition, can actually interfere with itself. That's, that's what we saw happening. Okay, so let's accept that. And although um, well, it's clear actually that physics isn't done yet and that quantum mechanics isn't the final, the final word of it, but nevertheless, this is the best we have today and let's get on with it. So now the idea of quantum computing is to use, well, one part of it is to use this superposition principle and apply it to computers and computing, and in particular to bits. So as we all know that bit can be zero or one, when we talk about, and, and, and let's now sort of adopt already some of the notation, I will write vectors for zero and a vector for one. And a quantum bit is just a superposition of zero and one. So one way of viewing that is by means of this nice little picture, but a more <laughs> rigorous way of doing it is by, by saying it's a vector in a vector space where uh, the superposition tells you uh, how much zero, in this case alpha, and how much one you are, and it's just a vector in this vector space, and um, such a qubit, which we can describe this way, um, uh, is just uh, um, um, so this 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 is what the physicists call cat, and I will later make this more precise. But this is just a, a vector, a basis vector, and this is a, another basis vector. And it will any qubit is a valid qubit as long as uh, you satisfy the following rule, namely this alpha and this beta can be complex numbers. And moreover, when you take the norm squared and you add these two, you should get exactly one. So that's a a rule or axiom of quantum mechanics. So when you go to home later today and you want to think about qubits, then everything is, is valid as long as you satisfy this rule. Second uh, postulate of, of, of quantum mechanics is, is what physicists call measurement. And when you have a qubit, you want to be able to, to look at it, you want to be able to measure it. And it would be nice if you would actually get these alpha and beta. But unfortunately, nature is not that nice. If you measure a qubit, then you will actually see either a zero or a one, just like a classical bit. But if you made a superposition that is non-trivial, then actually this measurement will induce a probability distribution. So measuring a qubit, which is alpha zero plus beta one, will give you a probabilistic bit, which is zero with probability alpha squared and one with probability beta squared. Moreover, when you measure this qubit and you got your outcome, you have destroyed this nice superposition and you're actually stuck with either the zero state or the one state. So it's like projecting the superposition onto one of these states and the length of the projection square gives you the, the, the probability of observing that. And note now that it was a good thing to have this rule that alpha squared plus beta squared was equal to one, because otherwise you would not be able to say that it would give you a probability. Okay, so these qubits can't actually be made, and they are being made by physicists all over the world. For example, here you see a qubit that is uh, made in Delft in the Netherlands, where you have like a little circuit, you see it is a ring, these things are called squids, and uh, what you can ha what you can do is you can make you can uh, let the current float through this ring, and what they were able to do is you can let the current flow like clockwise, or you can let it flow counterclockwise. And what they did in Delft was they had the, the current both flow clockwise and counterclockwise at the same time. So it's 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 it's, it's interesting 
No, and, and of course, clockwise you could say is a zero, and counterclockwise is a one, and hence you can have a, a, a qubit in, in this way, in actions. That's the reason why they, they did this. But also it's interesting because you have all these electrons, not just a single one, but a thousand of them, or I don't know how many they have, but a significant amount, being in the superposition of going one way around and going the other way around. So it's, it's, it's really not fantasy what I'm talking about. I mean, these things really can be can be observed in nature. Uh, another um, promising uh, Im implementation of qubits is by means of trapped ions. And here you see, I don't know, uh, one, two, six, I think. And wh what you can do is you can trap these ions and, and cool them and have them in a ground state or an excited state. And the ground state is a zero and an excited state is one. And uh, there you have your qubit. You can have superpositions of these. Of course, the problem is to, to, to not just build one, but, but build many. And so that's just a big engineering or physical challenge to, to build as many uh, as we, we, we computer scientists like. But my, my talk will not be about the, the physical implementation, but about the things that you can do with these qubits, or that you could do with these qubits once they, would be, or, uh, once they are, let's be, be positive, once they are available. Um, let's take another example, uh, just uh, for the fun of it. Um, here I have a qubit which has an equal amount of zero and an equal amount of one. Uh, and note that one over square root of two squared is a half, so a half will be the probability that I observe the zero, and also a half will be the probability that I observe a one. So this is an, I, I would say, a, a probabilistic um, an incarnation of a qubit and note that after my measurement this qubit will be either a zero if I measured a zero or it will be a one if I measured a one but also it will give you an ideal source of almost, I mean of perfect if you could do this perfectly, of perfect randomness and now this is not also not just talk or um, so I believe because um, there's a company in Switzerland, Idee Quantique, which actually sells uh, number generators based on this very principle. Here you have what is inside their box, so they claim. Uh, there's a light source which shines again these photons, and there's something here that's called the beam splitter, which with probability 50% will reflect one way, and with probability 50% will reflect the other way. And here they have these photon detectors, and when this detector clicks, and it's a zero, and when this detector clicks, it's a one. And I guess sometimes both detectors click, and then they discard the, 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 the outcome. And uh, by the way, I, I, I haven't, I did not bring it with me, but I have one. I actually bought one because I was curious to play with it. And well, that do they provide some kind zero of warranty? Um, For example, if you show them that the complexity of the outcome is small, will you they reimburse your expenses? Um, you can use your service, of course. Well, well, well I, 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 I think of it more as a science. science. I mean, they're, they're also not, not so rich, but it would be great if you could show that what comes out, well, then something is wrong with the device, or if you're really lucky, quantum mechanics is wrong, but I, I would believe that their device then somehow is wrong. So I, I could not detect how much is it? What, what do you want to... How much do you want to... The price. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. How much do you want to pay? <laughs> <laughs> we, we can talk. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on, on the warranty you provide with it. <laughs> um, I think it was like 400 euros or something like that. And for the second hand? For second hand? Yeah. You <laughs> well, who says a minus second hand? So minus. But actually, it's kind of. I mean, it's kind of fun to have this thing and be. And with what size is it? Okay, just oh, kind of. Uh, it's this. Yeah. So it's a. It's this big. Mm -hmm. It's a little black. It's black. It's a black box. <laughs> and it has a green light on, <laughs> which I don't think does anything. But it's there. Um, well, all these things of, of weekly random sources then come to mind because, of course, this thing is not perfect and it will have maybe some bias. And then you can sort of apply all this nice research that has been going around to, to extract and using extractors, etc., to use randomness, to extract randomness from these 
weekly random sources because I do believe that these things are they do have uh, some non-trivial entropy. Also, you, you you will be able to generate incompressible strings with this thing. So, how much would you offer for an incompressible string of length? A thousand? It depends on the warranty, what you provide if I try to compress it. I will give you another one if you can. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Microsoft. <laughs> You're not a fair warranty. Um, okay. Please. Enough? <laughs> Let, 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 let's sort of, in, in, a, in a sneaky way, go to, to more qubits and then make it more rigorous. Um, uh, a simple way of thinking of it is, um, yeah, I'm still missing part of the screen. Could you change the resolution? Yeah, I don't know. Um, let's see. Should I try this? Uh, of course, there's now a possibility that. Great. Uh, <laughs> not so great. It's a left side. It's no, it's working. Yeah. Нет, с экраном то все в порядке. Нет, 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 uh, which one was it? But you, maybe you can just zoom out your screen and get this. Mm -hmm. Choose this one. Yeah. Choose this one. Yeah. I think that's the one I used. Ah, uh, let's see. Can try another. But just, just you can show the picture smaller without all this. Try this. Much better. <laughs> 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 oh, okay, uh, this is this thing here, yeah, I don't want that. Factory default. No, no, no. And now external, maybe it's a good idea. I think the problem is that the presentation is more widescreen with the video. Yeah. If, it, if you could probably, probably zoom out the presentation. No, I cannot. Wait, wait, can PowerPoint do that? <laughs> no, I'm trying to show it within a window, not full screen. It's so not PowerPoint, that's a whole point. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, but then, yeah, it's very short. Your cooks will miss. We'll continue. Yeah. 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 Has to sum up to one, and they induce a probability, but now of four outcomes. And for example, outcome um, one one has probability uh, alpha four squared, alpha four there, to to be seen. And when you generalize to n qubits, you will get a superposition of two to the n basis states. Each will have a particular amplitude. You will want that this amplitude sums up to one one is cut off here, and the probability of a seeing state J 
is just the amplitude in front of that state squared. So in particular, and this is uh, important to, to remember and keep all the time in the back of your mind when you see a, a, a thing like this, which is called a cat, and this is called a bra, and together they are a bracket, then this just means a, 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 a vector that has norm 1, L2 norm 1 in some space, and just immediately when you see this, just translate it into a vector and, and use your linear algebra, and when you see something like this, so the, the, the reverse of this, that is just by definition the complex conjugate transpose of this vector. So this thing is this, if this is a, 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 a column, then this is a row where all the entries have been complex uh, conjugated. For example, the, 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 zero, the zero basis state is just this. <coughs> This vector, the one basis state, is this vector. Note that I just arbitrarily chose a basis, but you have to fix it. Something it's called the, we call it a computational basis. Um, and and when I talk about the superposition, I have this this vector that has an alpha here and a beta here. Also on the space we de define an inner product, and that the inner product is just be between two vectors is just the, the, the complex conjugate transpose of one times the other one. Um, and and, and that, that induces uh, uh, an angle between the two vectors. And um, more, more uh, of, or, or, or interesting or actually trivial to observe is that if you take the inner product with yourself, then you will get the, the sum of the amplitude squares back and this should be 1. Another way of saying the L2 norm of this vector is 1. Uh, another thing that I'll be using is uh, something called the tensor product, which you probably all know, but let me quickly run it by. Um, we have a matrix A and a matrix B. Then the tensor product A times B is this uh, larger matrix, which contains of four copies of B. And each copy of B has been multiplied with the, 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 the scalar that was coming from uh, matrix A. So in particular, the dimension of A tensor B is equal to the dimension of A times the dimension of B. And... Um, what do you mean by a dim dimension of a matrix? It's not that. The size. The size of the matrix. Yeah. yeah. So, ah, so maybe let me go out here. Um, so the 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 the, 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 the so, so the tensor product is a way of of ma ma de um, defining more qubits. If you have one qubit and you want to talk about another qubit, then you you form the tensor of these two. So the zero tensor zero is will give us this bigger vector which has a one here and zeros everywhere else, and this way you, you will be able to define a new basis in this larger space, which consists out of these tensor zero of, of the s smaller spaces. And tensor also has a physical meaning. If I have a particle in one part of my space physically, and I have a particle in my other space, then mathematically you write this thing tensor this thing. So this, this also represents space-like separate things. And what I will be sh uh, doing frequently, I will be writing instead of zero tensor zero, I will write maybe zero, cat zero, cat zero, or even cat zero zero. And all these things are the same thing. They will mean the same thing. Okay, so this we have had. Okay, so once you have a, uh, a qubit, and we have defined the multiple qubits in, in, in our space, we want to be able to do something with it. So if we have a bit, there's actually not much that you can do with it. You can either do nothing to it or you can negate it. But to a qubit, there's actually a whole lot more you can do. And um, this is what the physicists call evolution. And again, here comes a new postulate. And the postulate says that the evolution has to be a linear operator, operation. It has to be a, ma a matrix 
that you multiply your vector with. And so that's, that's a postulate. And postulate 2 says actually something very I mean, useful or trivial. If I have a qubit and I do an operation to it, it still should be a qubit. In particular, it should still induce this probability distribution when I measure it. Or it still should have the L2 norm 1. And uh, linear operators that preserve the norm are unitary operators. And you, I mean, and, and another way of saying it is that if you take your your linear your matrix, your linear operator, and you multiply it with its complex conjugate transpose, then you get the identity. Uh, and, uh, so, so you can think of this 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 operation, the complex conjugate transpose, the star, or sometimes called uh, the physicists put it beggar, as um, the reverse operation of the, the the operation of U. So it undoes what U did. Another way of thinking it is about rotations of this vector in this vector space, preserving the, the length of that vector. Um, here is a, a, a useful uh, transformation that I'll be using. It's called the Hadamard transform. It's a transformation or it's a matrix that, that operates on, on a single qubit. And um, it has this uh, uh, entries 1 over square root of 2 and note here it has a minus 1 over square root of 2 and when you take the